Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Helene Lipson Show. I'm your host, Helene Lipson, and you are listening to In5G Radio. It's October 1st, 2014, and it's another great day to be alive. Our special guest today is Matt Kahn. Matt is a spiritual teacher, mystic, and intuitive healer. His spontaneous awakening arose out of an out-of-body experience at the age of eight, as did his direct experiences with ascended masters and archangels throughout his life. Using his highly attuned, intuitive abilities of seeing, hearing, feeling, and direct knowing, Matt serves as a bridge between the mystical realms and the journey of awakening. Many spiritual speakers have experienced amazing, unexplainable, physical, and emotional healings, and have awakened to their true nature through Matt's profound and loving teachings and transmissions of sacred heart wisdom. I personally must say, I listen to so many of his videos, even over and over and over again, every single time getting something new out of it. And um, every time I listen to his voice, it absolutely raises my own vibrational frequency. I am so thrilled that he's here to be our special guest on the show today. Let me introduce you. Here is Matt Kahn. Matt, are you here? I am here with you. What an honor to be with you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Wow. This is this is a great day for me. I am so excited. So so thank you so much again. I I would love to start to hear about your own journey to love. I'd love to hear how you were able to embody this love that that emanates from you as as you speak. Well, it's, it's a very interesting journey in that for me my journey began, you know, from a very young age when I was about 6 years old a lot of mystical experiences, a lot of deep, profound spiritual awakenings throughout my life from the age of, you know, eight, um, all the way through my adolescence and my young adult life. For me, what was interesting is that my very first experience of leaving my body and finding myself in the most beautiful garden I've ever seen with colors that basically just emanated this vibration of love and that experience left me with a palpable knowingness of love and safety that I've never felt in my life before that point. And even though for most of my life I would go from one mystical experience to the next, and there was lots of realizations, life-changing insights, awakenings of consciousness, and these things were very treasured experiences. I embraced them, and they're wonderful. But there was something deep inside of me that, without saying anything, just kind of guided me not to hold on too tightly to anything I've ever experienced or realized, almost as if that in the background it was that feeling of love that I felt in the garden at a young age that somehow was guiding me deep into my journey to not stop looking and exploring until that's what I found. And so what was really interesting is I remember being a young adult and having already had a lifetime of life-changing spiritual experiences, many experiences talking to ascended masters and archangels. And what I realized in myself was, despite how energetically sensitive I was, despite how intuitive I was, despite how many experiences I had had, despite how many awakenings I had had up to that point, what I realized is I couldn't define my, my let's say, my insight or my level of consciousness by the experiences that I had racked up. And that I found myself 
still unable to really open myself up and feel totally safe in the world, and even knowing how to interact with people unless I was talking about these kind of spiritual experiences. And so for me, it was as if there was a revolution brewing in my heart. There was a revolution that started with this really powerful question. And the powerful question is, what does it matter how many spiritual experiences I have? What does it matter if I have the universe's number on speed dial? What does it matter that I can talk to archangels and ascended masters? What does it matter that I've had all these awakenings if I'm still afraid in my body and unable to open up and really connect with others? And it was shortly after this this question or this declaration, this, this revolution started brewing in me, that I received a download from the universe and from the Ascended Masters. And the instructions were actually very simple, four simple words, and all I heard was, whatever arises, love that. And I didn't ask for more clarification, because one of the interesting things is that when you have a level of intuition and you can connect at any time and get information, some of the more interesting adventures is to not ask any questions and just kind of figure it out as you go along and so i just took the instructions quite literally and i just went around and whatever would arise whatever i saw or felt i would just love so i saw a butterfly flying past me so i sent an i love you to it i saw a city worker you know working on the side of the road with a jackhammer that got my attention so i sent an i love you silently to that city worker uh, I, I found myself startled by a car screeching by, so oh, that, that's, there's a feeling of being startled in my body, so I'll love that. And I just literally sent I love you to anything that I saw or felt. And I just did this for about three days. And within three days of doing this, it was as if everything I knew about myself as a person, everything I knew about myself as a collector and rememberer of my history, just kind of vanished out of my consciousness. And it was as if I was just a living expression of consciousness, of light. I was present in the experience of my body, but I had no sense of attachment. I had no sense of fear. And it was as if just loving my own self and loving the things that would arise manifested this love within me from a dormant state into coming to life. And in that, it dramatically changed my personal experience in no longer being someone who's trying to find their place in the world or someone that feels unsafe in the world to actually being the light of love simply appearing human in form. And it was at that point where all of a sudden it was loving myself and loving others took all the spiritual experiences I had took all the awakenings and everything that had happened, and it was almost like it brought it all full circle and let it become an embodied experience instead of just a history of interesting things to remember. And so that's, for me, when my path went from a history of interesting experiences to the living embodiment of love and action. And it literally occurred one I love you at a time. Wow. Wow. That is really it's it's really powerful, and I, I, it it makes me jump to think about so many people that are focusing on maybe Monsanto or fluoride in the water or dirty politicians or the dreadful banking system. Now, I personally try to live a healthy life, and I tune out the news. But some right. people say that there's kind of a fine line. Um, they've said that refusing to look at the critical information that makes you feel uncomfortable is like willfully choosing to remain in a state of ignorance and remain sure. unconscious. So what do you do? Do you look at Monsanto and love it? No. Well, yeah. no. <laughs> that's not the only answer. Wouldn't that be funny? Nope, that's it. No, <laughs> no, no I'm just kidding. Um, here's my here's my two cents on this. Here's what I'm guided to share on this. Good. It's not about resisting Monsanto, which I understand that, of course, if we're just going to talk about things 
you know, on the surface, obviously there's a company putting poison into our crops, and that's not what your body wants to ingest. So I understand why everyone is up in arms about this, and I and I am someone who is a is a promoter of organic, you know, farming. And every day when I go to the market, and every day when I make myself a meal, three times a day, I am voting for organic food by eating organic. So for me personally, the way that I contribute to this issue is I eat organic, I eat non-GMO foods. But if we're going to talk about it in a very, you know, even deeper than that, it's not about loving Monsanto. It's not about despising Monsanto. It's about asking yourself, what do I feel in response to something like Monsanto? And whatever the feelings are that something like that manifestation of Monsanto or whatever fill-in-the-blank thing that we're trying to overcome is, Whatever that brings up in me is actually showing me as a manifestation of the universe the next thing in me that I can love and embrace the way it's never been loved before. So it's not about loving the thing outside of you. It's not about pushing away or trying to fight the thing outside of you. It's letting anything outside of you bring your attention to your feeling. And whatever that feeling is, is your opportunity to love that in yourself knowing that what you're loving in yourself, you're clearing out of your energy field, and what you're clearing out of your energy field isn't necessarily your individual karma to resolve. It is your contribution to clearing out the karma out of the collective unconsciousness. So all the work we do as individuals to love ourselves and accelerate our healing is our participation to awaken the collective unconsciousness so that we can live in a world as an enlightened society. So it's not about pushing away Monsanto, it's not about revolting, it's not about loving, it's about how do you feel in response to that news story and whatever arises is your chance to love that in yourself, knowing that as you're loving it within yourself, you're not only lightening your energy field, but you're contributing to the positive transformation on this planet that as the vibration is elevated for all, the frequency will become so high that something like Monsanto simply disappears out of existence. Yeah. Actually, even here on the island where I live, and I live um, on Kauai, so many people now are aware of it and have bonded together as a result of it and will get together and make changes um, because of it. People, it is really bonded a community together more than more than you can believe so let's just uh, let's talk about the let's, like, let's talk about the balance even if we talk about the balance of this just to kind of take it a step further there are people that sit in their homes and they love their own heart and they contribute energetically to the healing of the planet which is totally wonderful and those people that are doing that work aren't necessarily bonding together in communities as as often or as conscientiously as the people, like you're saying, where you live in Kauai, and, and equally the people in Kauai that bond together in community to, to bring awareness to this and, and to do something positive to create change may not always be making the time to love their own hearts. So it just goes to show you that we're all playing our part. Some of us are meant to bond together into community to face the issue head on, some of us are simply here to feel how we feel in response to the news story and love our own hearts as a way of transforming the consciousness of all. And really what's important is that we all tune into our hearts and we say, what role am I meant to play? What is my contribution to the evolution of this planet? And even if you don't know whether I'm supposed to be a part of a community or if I'm just here to help anchor this new, energet- this new energy energetically, Perhaps, even if we don't know, we can use that as an opportunity to send I love yous and embrace the one that doesn't know as a way of unraveling confusion and doubt out of the energy field of the world for the well-being of all. So again, no matter where we are at, no matter what we are called to do, or even when we don't know what to do, loving what arises can always be an instinctive response that allows us in any moment that we simply say, I love you to our heart over and over again. We are energetically lightening our field, opening our heart, bringing forth our highest vibrational frequency to allow the world to be transformed so that all can thrive and shine within it. Mm. 
I'm telling you, Matt Khan, I've got a big smile on my face. That made me feel so good. Maybe it's just listening to the tone of your voice, or maybe it's just the message that you say, but I really do I really do feel like um people are waking up in droves. And um I wanna say I, I I've been listening to so many of your videos, but um the first wave of ascension is one of my favorites. And you talk, you actually give a date in this video. You say on September twenty seventh, two thousand and fifteen you say it's a very special date, and at that time, one-third of the human collective will have ascended to a fifth-dimensional consciousness. So I'd love to hear more about what we can expect to see at that time and how we could know if we're part of that first wave of ascendance. Well, the way we know if we're the part of the first wave of ascension is that the first wave of ascension is basically a name that's given to those in the world who find themselves being very energetically sensitive. So if we find ourselves confused about, I don't know if this is my experience or if I'm picking up on the energy of other people's experience, uh, uh, another sign of being energetically sensitive is there's always this deep spiritual calling in me. I'm always thinking about what's beyond the things I can just see. Perhaps there's a feeling of I meant to serve the planet in a greater way and I don't know really what my first step is. The first wave of ascension are the beings that are here that happen to be very energetically sensitive. And it's those who are energetically sensitive, which doesn't mean we're better than anyone else, it just means we are the most ready and capable to anchor a fifth dimensional energy that literally shines a light for the other two-thirds of the world to start following in a new direction energetically. And what I mean by September 27, 2015, or what I was told, is that at that date, a third of the world, which is the first wave, will be anchored into the fifth dimension. Now, that doesn't mean that a third of the world is going to disappear off of this planet and go to some other planet. It's more so that this Earth is already in a fifth dimension, and it's by that date the energetically sensitive beings will no longer be perceiving life through their three-dimensional goggles or interpreting their life through three-dimensional belief systems. And in fact, it's more of like thinking about taking off a pair of glasses that have been obscuring your vision. So it's kind of like the world's already in the fifth dimension, but we're all walking around wearing these goggles that make everything really exaggerated and really it mixes up the way we see things. So it's not like we're going to a separate location. It's just a matter of, by that date, a third of the world of energetically sensitive beings will have been integrated and activated to a point where those three-dimensional goggles and belief systems can dissolve and disappear. And from that place, we will not only be anchoring a fifth-dimensional frequency in our energy fields, but we will be living in a fifth-dimensional alignment, which means we will be living from a state of cooperation versus competition. We'll be living from our hearts instead of lost in our heads. There will be a sense of harmony that brings us all together for the well-being of all versus just a a single-minded sense of self-interest. There will be a sense of unity where even though we're different individuals, there is something deep within us that connects us as one. You know, we, we will be living from that space. It doesn't mean we have to necessarily be in those kind of communities because we're all sprinkled around the earth because the fifth dimensional energy that we embody and radiate is literally starting to uplift the fields and ignite the souls of all who are around us. So we're all kind of sprinkled around so that that energy can start to permeate and be absorbed in everyone else's hearts. And so it's by that date, there will be a third of us on the planet that will be living from a very activated and aligned place. And because that date's coming quite shortly, a lot of us are going through a lot of accelerated awakenings, expansions, going through a lot of energetic upgrades, experiencing a lot of really bizarre physical ailments, emotions that are up one moment, down the next. And a lot of us, what we're going through are a lot of what I call ascension symptoms. And we're going through a very progressive healing, awakening, and transformational process because we have a lot of things to heal and clear so that by that date, we'll be anchoring the energy that brings the world into a new paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm really, I'm really glad you mentioned the ascension symptoms, you know, because so many people expressing at least a feeling that things are changing in their lives. And besides even physical symptoms, I've seen around me that um, for people, like a lot of chapters are coming to an end and new ones are beginning. And a lot of bits of fear are being released and, and, um, you know, there's, there also seems to be a lot of people who aren't sure what this new chapter looks like, and um, they're just trying to stay in trust. So what is the best way to get in touch with the next step on our individual path that support our highest expression at this time? The next step, I would say, would be to make sure that however we feel in our experience, however we feel in response to our experience, meaning you don't have to pretend to accept and love something if you really don't accept and love it. And we shouldn't feel like we're breaking spiritual rules if we feel that way. Because, again, the first step of loving what arises is being honest with your experience. So be honest with your experience. Wow, I'm going through a lot of ascension symptoms, and uh, I couldn't hate it more. And so if you are first honest with yourself about your experience, then the next step is, that once you're honest with your experience, then the one who has that kind of unhonest experience can be seen as the next one in line to be loved. So I guess it's a two-part step, and it is first be totally honest about your experience. Do not judge your experience as good or bad, or I've got to come, instead of coming from this place, I've got to come from this place. Just be totally honest about your experience, recognizing, of course, that what experience you're being honest about is just reminding you that when you feel this way about your experience, You deserve more love, not less. So the real preparation is starting to become the person who's always first in line to love you in response to any experience you're having and to make I love you the most popular word you say to your heart, whether you like your experience, whether it's inconvenience or inconveniencing you, whether it is annoying you, agitating you, whether it is causing you to lash out with judgment, Instead of judging ourselves for needing to act more spiritually obedient, why not just say, let me be honest about my experience. It's happening this way for a reason. Maybe it's happening so I can be totally honest with myself and not judge myself as if I need to fit into, you know, a cookie-cutter kind of spiritual path where I have to, you know, act in this certain criteria. Why don't I just be honest and go, here's how I feel. Here's the honesty of it. And I accept that I'm feeling this way because this is an opportunity for me to love me more than anyone's ever loved me when I feel this way. So again, it's being honest with your experience and then taking the time to love the one having the experience, letting I love you be the most popular phrase that you say to yourself on a daily basis. And then, of course, beyond that, as we walk around in the world, we can send silent I love you to every person we pass by. If we're driving down the street, we can send I love you to every car that passes by knowing that the I love yous we send out to one are always blessings that manifest in the hearts of all. And that really is the first as well as the final step in ascension because ascension can be distilled down to returning to love. Ah, oh, makes a lot of sense, though. Even silently walking around and saying, I love you, to, to whatever person, whatever duck that is on the ground and, and, uh, and the dogs that are walking by and even the plants, yes. you're feeling the love. And then you're attracting the love because you're on a frequency of love. And yes. so love begets love, which actually, uh, so you know, I guess I, I want to talk about true love. I want to talk about True romantic love. Higher dimensional romantic relationships. You know, connection on every level. Connection physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually with a partner. How does one attract a divine partner or soulmate these days? I'd like to know that. (laughs) By not looking for it. I'm not looking for it. Here's I mean, why I say so that. obvious, I guess. 
I know. I know. Well, I kind of. I kind of thought you. Well, hey, well, here, well, well, let's let's take this deeper. There is a desire to have a partner, to have love physically, emotionally, spiritually with that partner. But here's the epidemic. Usually, the romance, and even it's it's like it could be a spiritual romance. The romance is, I'm going to attract a partner who's going to come into my reality. They're going to come in like a superhero, and they're going to save the day, and they're going to finally give me the experiences that I don't know how to cultivate within myself. And while that's a very romantic notion, and I'm not saying that it's not possible to manifest that twin flame energy and to have that kind of a tantric love affair on an emotional, physical, and energetic level, but what the problem is is that we are holding out for those type of experiences We are giving our power away to the anticipation of an idea that says, I'm not going to open my heart as wide as I will until this person shows up so that they can help me stir up the experiences that I've convinced myself I can only have with another person. And what that creates inside of us is a state of energetic codependency where we give our power to what can be created with another without first finding it within ourself, cultivating it within ourself. And once you are a fully embodied expression of love, overflowing with the bliss and ecstasy of your true nature, that's when another enters your reality, simply to mirror it back and to help you celebrate the actualization of it in a rather amplified way. But the problem is, is and, I, and, and I see this all the time, is there are energetically sensitive beings who have told themselves not until I manifest that soulmate am I going to have the kind of experiences I want and all of their happiness and fulfillment is put into the anticipation of that partner and they walk around like a spiritual casting director looking for the, does this person fit that criteria? Is this the person? Is this the person? And we're walking around trying to fit random people into that criteria instead of realizing we are unknowingly holding ourselves hostages waiting until we meet our quote-unquote twin flame before we open up to receive the love that we have to literally offer to ourselves. So the greatest thing you can do is stop looking for a soulmate and love yourself. And if there's disappointment, we love the disappointment. If there's loneliness, we love the loneliness. If there's a desire to make love to our soulmate, we send I love you to that part of our body because we're not going to manifest the kind of clean energy from a soulmate or a twin flame unless we are fully grounded and activated in the truth of our being. So again, the irony is that beings who are not grounded or activated are running around looking for other people to be activated by instead of stopping where they're at, entering the love revolution and instead of waiting for their partner to say the words that they need to hear, they start whispering those words into their heart. Instead of waiting for someone else to activate them into an experience, they start activating themselves by becoming the love they're waiting to receive. Or instead of waiting for that partner to be the one that coaxes you into saying such loving things to them, let me practice and prepare for the arrival of my soulmate by saying to myself all of the things I'm going to say to them and even saying and doing for myself all of the things that I anticipate them bringing to me. And it's just a much more mature way to enter into this higher vibrational alignment and to allow ourselves to understand Tantra is not just the ecstasy we find when merging with another. Tantra is the ecstasy we discover within ourselves when we find the truth of our being and realize there is no other other than the love that we are. Mm. I am hearing a running theme. It is a love re- uh, it is a love revolution today. It's a this show is a love fest and uh, gosh this was that was a beautiful answer. And uh, if it all starts with self-love, Matt, that's where it starts. And um, and it just it just spills out of you because you're so full of love. Yeah. And then you draw to you somebody that is as full and as whole 
as you are. I guess right, what and that's I will tell you, all about. And I will tell Beautiful. you that in the cultivation of love, for, for me, love is a daily cultivation, meaning I'm, my vibration is constantly being upgraded and I'm always receiving new teachings, meaning there's never an end to how, how, how brightly I will shine. And for those that have spent time uh, with Julie and I in retreat or at our events or in our Angel Academy, or even through these interviews, every time I'm participating, I'm always at a higher vibration. I'm always bringing through different teachings because I'm constantly going through that refinement process because love doesn't ever stop shining brighter. It doesn't stop elevating and expanding. But when I was really kind of going through this process in my own life, when I was awakening the love revolution within myself to become the energy that people feel where I can radiate an energy through the sound of my voice and you can just feel it activating things within you just by listening to me. One of the things that I did that allowed me to cultivate this is I spent a lot of time alone. And it wasn't alone from the perspective of no one's here to love me alone. For me alone was now I get to be the first one in line who loves me all the time. So sometimes being alone can be a little more like isolation because we think no one's here to love me. And the one who says no one is here to love me is the one who in alone needs to learn to love you. So when we're alone, we get to confront the fact that instead of waiting for someone else to do things for us, we get to learn how to do that for ourselves. And in the beginning, there's that thought and ego of, well, that's not the same. Loving myself is not the same as someone else. But the more we start to love ourselves, the more it starts to change. And all of a sudden, self-love isn't such a foreign concept. And then all of a sudden, our body is told that this is familiar, and it gives our body permission to feel the frequency of love that we are pouring into our heart. And then we start to realize on a bigger level that our heart is actually the center of the universe. And through the heart that we love, all things are transformed as one. So every time I love my heart, I'm transforming all things in existence. But for me, all of that became known and evident by spending a lot of time alone. And no matter what impulse arose in me, it wasn't like I think impulses are bad, but no matter what impulse it was, ooh, soulmate over there, ooh, experience over there, that didn't entice me because I saw that the desire wasn't really wanting to be fulfilled. The desire was just a part of me that was just asking for loving attention. So I just loved the desires instead of acted upon them. And it was by being totally alone and a allowing myself to be the one that loves me more than anyone else has ever loved me. And I don't say that like I've ever had a lack of love in my life. I just needed to become that much more loving in my life. And by being alone and being the only love I could rely on, because love is a powerful choice, but what I did in my journey is I didn't just choose love. I put myself in a position where love was the only choice, the only choice to rely on. When love becomes the only choice you have, and you give yourself no other option but just to love yourself, you may not always love others because you need to love the you that feels however you honestly feel. And when I gave myself the only choice of I'm just going to love myself in response to anything, that's when magic happened. Mm. Great words of wisdom. Great advice to, to really, you know, if there weren't all these programs of judgment, Matt, we would all be naturally loving ourselves. It's, I mean, that's the natural state as divine beings, loving ourselves. You know, and yet all the, the programs, people, but the programs mm-hmm. give us things to love. It's all a part of the bigger plan. See, we can mm-hmm. say, if I didn't have the programming, I just, I'd be naturally loving. But if you didn't have the programming, there'd be nothing to love. So the programming arises to give your love target practice. <laughs> this is good. All right, now I am going to switch gears again. I want to I want to talk about dreams and the dream world. Sure. Um, is reality and life as we know it like being in a dream in a dream? It certainly is one way of saying it. I I like to think of it as life is like being in a movie. So, like, let's imagine we're all sitting in a movie theater, and we see a screen 20 feet in front of us, and the screen is flat, 
and we are there is obviously an awareness that there is space between us in the theater and the screen that we're seeing. And then we take the edges of this flat screen and we bend it around. So like on both sides, it's kind of like, we're kind of like making an oval with the screen. And it bends around and both of the ends of the screen connect behind your seat in the theater. So it's like now a circular screen. And you're still sitting in the theater, but your seat in the theater is actually in the body of the main character in a screen that's all around you. That's more like how reality is, where we're sitting in a circular screen and our seat in the theater is within the body of the main character. So we are experiencing what it's like to evolve as these, as these characters while being these characters. There's no, closer way, there's no closer perspective to get to a character than to be the I am of the character. And so it's as if we're living in a movie a movie that on a certain level of consciousness has already been written and directed. Like when you go to a theater, you may be watching the movie for the first time, but that movie was filmed and edited at least a year and a half before you got there. So everything has already occurred, and yet in our experience, it feels like it's just happening for the first time because we're giving ourselves a chance to have a dynamic new experience. So I like to think of it like a movie where it's already occurred, but in my experience, it seems like it's brand new, because I'm giving myself a chance to really experience what has already been created to unfold. And the more we accept that the highest possibility has already occurred, the highest success has already been accounted for, the more we accept that the highest possibilities have already occurred, we then bring ourselves to a level of consciousness where the highest possibility of every moment can actually be, be seen to be the only way life is. Meaning, the highest possibility of your journey has already occurred. Somewhere down the line, you're going to have this magnificent experience. You're going to feel like you participated and it was all because of you. And that's just you giving yourself an experience of what's already transpired. At the same time, the more you accept that the highest has already occurred and we've already succeeded in all as well, then all of a sudden you start to see that in every moment, every moment is only occurring to bring you to the next highest level of consciousness, preparing you to be aligned and to experience the evolution of a character who will get to experience a success that is already awaiting all of our arrival. So I, I like to think hmm. of it like a movie. Like a movie? Already a movie. written and directed. Yeah, and yet what about, we, every... It, what about yeah. lucid dreaming? What about lucid dreaming? Like we're actually... What about lucid dreaming? So we're taking a part and we're actually... Isn't it happening now, like when we're doing lucid dreaming and we're creating it then and there? No. That's the, the fact that we think it's happening now is the experience you're having. You're having an experience of what it would be like to cre have to create it now you think you're making your experiences all spontaneously in that moment because the experience in that moment is what would it be like to experience this moment as if I was creating it. So you're having the experience that you're creating it in that moment, but even that was already accounted for. And so our choices don't actually create outcomes. Our choices are simply ways in which we look at options in every moment. We align the option that feels the best in our heart we say, hmm, what would love choose out of all these options? And whichever option gets closest to what, what love would do or seems to match our highest wisdom doesn't control the outcome of the experience, but literally gives us permission to have the most conscious or the most fulfilling quality of experience. So it's kind of like if we think of being in a movie theater. If you and I were in a movie theater and we're watching the screen, and you turn to me and you said, you know, Matt, if I do a certain kind of breathing, I can guarantee that Sandra Bullock and Morgan Freeman, these two main characters, I can, <laughs> I can guarantee that they're going to have the best possible outcome. And I say, oh, yeah? And then you start doing your, your interesting breathing. You know, we're watching the movie. I'm listening <laughs> to you do the breathing. And then the end of the movie, Sandra Bullock and Morgan Freeman – get to this high possibility, and you smile and you say, you see, it was because of my breathing that made that happen, and I smile at you and I say, <laughs> actually, this movie was filmed years ago. So you have the right to believe that in the theater, what you do in the theater changes the movie, 
but really all the choices you have simply determine the quality of the experience you have while watching the movie. So we don't need to control outcomes because if we know it's already happened, we know even when my life seems to go to hell or everything flips upside down, it's just another catalyst of expansion that is preparing me for a destiny that is greater than my wildest imagination. If it's already been taken care of, I don't have to worry about it. I just have to know that my choices don't ensure outcomes. My choices guarantee how lovingly, how safe, and how enjoyable of an experience I give myself in watching a movie that I'm playing out. Wow. So what, I mean, you're blowing my mind a little bit, Matt. So so I'm just saying, I'm just saying, what about life itself? How predetermined is that? Or how Everything's already created everything. Everything's predetermined, and in every moment you have the freedom of will to choose how to perceive it, to choose to imagine what everything means, symbolizes, and represents to you. But at a certain level of consciousness, you are smart. You are, you are aware enough, let's say, to say, hmm. If I decide what things symbolize to me, like for example, you could leave your house. And let's say you leave your house and all of a sudden you see some sort of black cat cross your path, right? You can go, "Uh uh-oh, that means something bad's going to happen. And then you can look throughout your day looking for the bad thing. And then all of a sudden you cross, you know, paths with a neighbor and something traumatic happened to them. You go, see, that's what the cat was trying to tell me. And you can put those things together if you want. But then you wake up one day and you realize, oh, my God, I'm actually creating the meaning that I give to things that nothing, nothing inherently has the meaning unless I give it, unless I affix the meaning, and even more outrageous, if I didn't take the time to give meaning and interpretation to the experiences that I have, I would actually be having the greatest experience I can't even imagine. And so what's interesting yeah. is we're all trying to find this deeper meaning, and there is a deeper spiritual meaning to life, But that deeper spiritual meaning can't be awakened and decoded in our consciousness until we take the meaning of what we think things symbolize and we put it aside. And it's in the it's and it's in the letting go of needing to interpret what we see or give separate meaning to things that we actually start to have the most heart centered experience and we start to see the deeper spiritual meaning behind all experiences that really have nothing to do with the superstitious ideas of what we project onto things. And so we have the freedom of will to say what things mean, to change what we think things mean, to have realizations based on those differences, to, to determine how we see what we see, which will then tell our body to interpret that view into an emotional state, which is a way for us to see how how aligned in love we are as we perceive things. So it's kind of like I have the freedom to see life however I wish. My body tells me when I'm seeing things through the eyes of love or when I'm seeing things through the eyes of fear. And in consciousness, I start to realize that the more often I see things through the eyes of love, I start to have better experiences. And the more I see things through the eyes of fear, I'm not having good experiences and I'm relying on controlling my experiences to hopefully one day get to the good experience. And so outcomes are predetermined. They only occur to ensure our highest growth and evolution. I could even say that your life is even taking place on infinite parallel dimensions where it's all taking place with infinite combinations of predetermined choices where as you're living your life right now, it's also happening in infinite ways, whereas at the end of your lifetime, You didn't just live out this one life in one way, but you lived it out in all ways. And from one day to the next, you're bouncing between different timelines. And so we're getting a taste of our life from all perspectives. And that instead of trying to hold it all together and understand this, because when I talk like this, it makes your mind want to blow up, which is kind of on purpose, because it's not about holding together and understanding. It's about saying, what if I let go of trying to control outcome? I accept it's already occurred. And I'm simply going to determine, I'm going to choose how I see each moment based on whatever view feels the most relaxed or inspired to my heart. 
and I allow love to see each moment. I allow love to speak each word. I allow love to make each choice, and I hand over all of my choices to love, and now I can live on permanent vacation, manifesting the highest will for all and living as the love that I am. Wow. Hello. Wow is my comment to all of this. I'd right, say, so, you know, you you make me start to think, you know, about, again, my multidimensional self. Yeah. I'm existing in several places at once. Still digesting what you're saying about the free will factor. Because I always did see that there was a free will component where, you know what, if I said that I was going to, you know, I, I if I said I was going to take a trip and get on to 95 South and go from New York to Florida, yeah, that maybe that was determined, but like I always thought that maybe I could always change my mind and hop on 80 West at any time and end up in California. And you were saying, well... You didn't change your mind. It was predetermined that you were going to be in California and not Florida. You didn't really have free will, but in fact, that was all scripted is, is how you were looking at it rather than the fact that somebody would make a choice and now you say, well, there's a multidimensional self. We're existing in several parts so that part of me would be in Florida, part of me would be in California, and a whole right. bunch of other places as well. And every single one of those possibilities playing out all at the same time. That's what I'm getting from what you said. So I'm just right. letting it all settle in. And yeah, I like it, it, yeah, yeah, that's right. I like the way it makes me feel when I think about that because yeah, so you might as well love what is because it's all happening and here it is and you're just playing it out and you're here for the experience. It's just another day at the movies, Matt. <laughs> well, and I, I, th I think also it starts to bring us into an awareness of a bigger plan. It starts to help us take so much of that pressure off of our shoulders because the irony is, and here's the irony, once you've accepted that it's already been orchestrated, only then do you have the relaxation and the peace within yourself to actually make the kind of choices that are in your highest alignment. So how's that for irony, that you have to accept it's all been done in order to start making the kind of choices that will bring such fulfillment and love into your life. And so there's no way to keep it straight because it's not as if free will and predeterminism are separate realities. They are counterparts. They are soulmates that are intertwined that cannot be separated. We've separated them into two ideas called predeterminism and free will. We can talk about them as separate ideas, but they're not separate realities. So even at our best, we're having a good understanding of two separate ideas, but they're actually not separate at all because you are still here making every choice, and every choice will determine the quality of your experience based on the vibration of the choice. But you can't access those high vibrational choices until you've accepted it's already occurred. So you must accept you've already made the greatest choices in your life to then step into a timeline where you will begin making the greatest choices of your life, but only choosing that after you've told yourself it's already occurred. It's wild. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that is wild. I actually, you know, this yeah. kind of, yeah. I'm just internalizing the information that, that we're talking mm -hmm. about right now, you know. I'm just like taking it in myself. I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears because it's like, I mean, but that's pretty deep down the rabbit hole. And actually, I mean, in one swift blow, I mean, you just changed my perspective on so many, so many things and asking that question. So, wow. That's what I have to say. Um, Wonderful. But okay. Here, I'm going to switch gears. I want to, let's talk a little bit, talk about different timelines. I didn't think it was predetermined. I thought it was a leap of faith that got me to um, basically sell everything I own and uh, have next to nothing and come live in Kauai, only taking with me my pets. And uh, just a couple of boxes of stuff and 
and decide I was going to settle here. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the energies here because I, I felt that I was called here. I wanted to ask you about the ancestors and the elders and the portals and also about the stonework. The some of the stonework here on Kauai predate the Hawaiian culture and is there some connection between the ancient stone work of Stonehenge and the work in Europe and South Africa and Indonesia and Kauai? Like, are they all connected? We're talking about Stonehenge, and it seems as if Stonehenge is an ancient sundial or calendar system. And it seems as if we look at Stonehenge or we look at the crop circles or we look at things in indigenous to Kauai, what we find is we find ancestral beings who created things, you know, with their, with with the materials they had at that time, but with information that was passed down and given to them from our star brothers and sisters. Which, for a lot of energetically sensitive beings, the the star brothers and sisters, the beings that have been visiting us, are, are actually from the planets that we originate from, and so. We talk about Kauai. My initial sense is that there there is a Lemurian connection to Kauai. That that perhaps Kauai was part of where Lemuria originated from, and that a lot of the energy of Kauai is very much Kauai is very much anchored into the fifth dimension in a very prominent way. And and of course that energy can do a lot a variety of things depending if you're grounded. If you're grounded, it can amplify you and expand you, and if you're not grounded, it can you know toss you around from one side of the island to the next. But my sense is that a lot of these things, whether it's Stonehenge, crop circles, pyramids, or Kauai, is that it's just evidence that there have been higher vibrational technologies passed down generation to generation from the very star beings that were helping humanity evolve, preparing and fertilizing the land for when the first wave of ascension of beings such as ourselves would come to the planet to become the integrated human beings, meaning the intelligence and vibration of the star beings integrated into human form and to become the leaders and the group of souls that would lead humanity into a full fifth dimensional alignment. Wow. Wow. Probably answers why I was uh, drawn to come here so in such sure. a strong way, you know. So what about the Pleiades and um, the Pleiadians and the connection, too? Because this is um, the Lemurians and the Pleiadians. This is um, This is a Pleiadian place, isn't it? Say that again. Is, uh, do you think Kauai is just kind of a Pleiadian a place too? I mean, feel right. that. I, I, I feel yeah, that. I think, yeah, I think Lemuria was a civilization where a lot of Pleiadian souls incarnated to anchor an energy on Earth, and so I look at Lemuria as an ancient Pleiadian civilization, and then I look at Kauai as kind of like a. Uh, kind of like a an anchor or a uh, let's call it a Pleiadian vortex, where it already has that fifth dimensional energy anchored in a lot of beings who suffer from homesickness and who came here to raise the vibration of Earth, but kind of you know are tired of going through the energetic ups and downs of life and the human condition and kind of want to go home, get attracted to these vortexes where they can be in an energy that feels like home while still being uh, here on Earth to fulfill the mission that they're here to take part in. Yeah, thank you for answering that. That was actually kind of a personal question and my wondering, and I appreciate it. I want to ask you maybe one one question or maybe two more, and then I want to... Um, I want to open the uh, phone lines to callers that have any questions for Matt. If you do want to call in and ask Matt a question, call 646-716-8890 and then press 1 to enter the host queue. Again, 
888-888-8890, press 1, and then you'll appear um, in the studio, and um, I'll just take callers. So as you're calling in, everybody, the last thing I wanted to ask is about spirit guides. Yeah. Everybody I know is born with um, spirit guides or um, some higher dimensional beings on the spirit side of life that work with us. And they work with us in, from the other dimensions to support us on our mission. And so many people um, are looking for some kind of advice on how to connect with their spirit guides. What could you say to those people wondering that? Well, I would say that a spirit guide is an externalized manifestation of your own energy field. And so while it is an amazing experience to connect with the guidance of your spirit guides, they are actually just expressions or reflections of your own knowing and divinity. They are foreshadows of what you are not only becoming, but what on the biggest in the biggest perspective, what you've already become. And while it can be very, again, just like the soulmate thing, very romantic to want to imagine yourself to be a person who's waiting for an angel or a being to step into your kitchen and start dispensing the mysteries of the universe, and I totally understand that. But we have to understand that as reflections or aspects of our own consciousness, sometimes the, guide, the spirit guidance isn't going to always come in that unique form that depending upon how we would respond or react to it, for some people, if they could have beings manifest and materialize in their living room, they'd never leave their house. And so guidance has to bring us the guidance in a way that's going to make us most functional. And if we could have these experiences and, you know, we'd be so mesmerized by them sometimes, we wouldn't actually be a part of the world that we're here to be a part of. So whether or not we're actually hearing our guides, because I, in my life, have heard beings talking to me, and I can talk to the universe and various spirit guides just like I'm talking to you. I've also had the experience of them all lifting up their faces like masks and seeing me underneath all of them. So it is a play of the consciousness that I am that is interacting with guides as carriers of other vibrational messages, but it is all occurring within the one that I am. So I know the play, and I can still interact with it, but for a lot of people, they're waiting to hear a separate voice, and if they don't hear a separate voice, they think something's wrong, my antenna's broken, my chakras are all messed up. And instead of trying to hear your guidance in a specific way and then get disappointed when you're not having the experience you want, the best way to hear what your spirit guides want you to hear is that oftentimes what your spirit guides are telling you that you can't hear another being tell you is actually what you are the most inspired advice-wise to want to tell people in your life. So the question becomes, you can take people in your life, people that trigger you the most, people that you spend the most amount of time with, the people that when you're around them, you always feel like, oh my God, if they only knew this, if they only took this advice that I had to give them, oh my God, their life would be so much better. What advice do you find yourself always wanting to give other people? And whatever advice you are eager to tell someone else, whatever the action step is you think that would help someone in your life, is actually what you are saying out loud only because that's what your spirit guides want you to hear yourself say because that's the one thing that you need to do next. Mm. So instead, wow. of waiting to hear a, instead of waiting to hear an angel say, Matt, this is the universe. This is the universe. Please go forth and do this. Instead of waiting for that, which is a wonderful experience if it happens to you, but nine times out of ten when that experience happens, it can create a greater attachment to that experience, meaning there becomes a greater attachment or there can be a greater attachment to your ego because you want to stay in ego to be a separate being having a conversation with a separate angel. It's one thing to have the universe on speed dial and talk to angels all day. But the first introduction is meeting these angels and talking to these guides. Then you have to go through the journey of actually becoming and merging into them. And when you merge into that experience, then your groovy conversation with them disappears. So sometimes having that kind of communication for people creates a greater attachment and keeps them 
from evolving at a fast enough pace. So the life's, life's not going to give us an experience that's going to create a, a greater barrier. Life's going to turn you into a person who is motivated to give other people advice. And whatever advice you would want to give to humanity, whatever you want, whatever you want to tell Monsanto to do, whatever you are just dying inside to give advice to your best friend of, oh, I wish you would just listen to me, whatever advice you are inspired to give to other people is exactly the next action step for you to take. And when you always hear your own advice as the next thing for you to do, that's when your spirit guidance starts to become more palpable and noticeable. Interesting. Now, what about our loved ones, though? I mean, what about our loved ones that cross over and connecting with them? It's something we have to kind of let come to us because the more we initiate, the more we kind of close that window because the, the window to the spirit world is attracted to openness and so we can be open and receptive but if we're going towards that communication we either manufacture something we want to have happen in our mind or we push so hard towards an experience that we're actually shutting the door and so it's imagine like you're running towards something and your hands are in front of you and your fingers are reaching to touch the thing that you want to bring towards you and you don't realize that your fingertips keep keep touching the very thing you're trying to grab and it's actually pushing it further away from you. So we're reaching towards things and not realizing that the fingertips that reach out to grab are actually pushing it further away. So even though we want to reunite with our loved ones, we want to have conversations with the spirit world, we have to actually develop a practice of stillness. And we have to say, I'm going to practice being totally okay, sitting still, opening my heart, relaxing my body, I'm going to set an intention that my loved ones on the other side, please communicate with me. And I'm just going to be open and and be a receptive channel to receive that information. But I'm not going to run towards it. I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to shut the door because that door of communication is attracted to openness. So I open myself up. I relax my body. I have no expectation of what's going to happen. And I let myself trust the process it's the most noble and courageous thing anyone can ever do on a spiritual journey and it's oftentimes what's the hardest thing to do and it, many people don't choose that path and then eventually when nothing works it becomes the only path they're meant to take so eventually everyone takes that path in the beginning it's not the most romantic path it's not the most seductive or sexy path but in the end when nothing else really works that's what we wind up doing is just sitting being an open, receptive channel, and letting it come to us on its terms. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. That actually is what I do for a living. This is just a... And and I do it for love. I mean, I work as an intuitive and and, um, and uh, talk with different people all day long. And... Whatever it is that comes, I don't. I don't know that it's necessarily a piece of myself because it shares. Well, whoever comes is sharing information of whoever is having a reading. Or I. Um, and uh, I never looked at it as my spirit guide. I never took the mask off to see what was underneath that. But I do know that it's extremely possible and pretty easy, too, to sit back and receive information about um, and messages that are related to other people and share them for their best and highest good. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess it just depends. In your experience or anyone's experience, it depends who you think you are. Meaning, when I say who I am, I'm not negating Matt Kahn as a separate person, a character that people see and are hearing right now. I don't actually experience myself as, like I experience myself as a person, I'll say that, but I'm not lost in the experience of being a person, meaning I'm having the experience of everything a person would experience. But I am having a living fully realized experience of the totality of all that is is dressed up as Matt experiencing all of this. So I'm experiencing Matt through the eyes of the universe with, of course, nothing but love for Matt. But at the same time, Matt is a costume I wear 
and does not limit the truth that I am. And of course, every other character that I meet in this play is also existing within the totality that I am, simply dancing in front of me to give this character, Matt, a chance to interact with with the world of many others. So my experience when I say I is as the all that is experiencing itself as one and all at the same time. And if we know ourselves to just be one character who has a name, who has abilities, which is totally fine, it's going to change the perception of our experiences versus if we are simply the one in all, then then our, our perspective broadens and allows us to see that even though we all seem to be separate characters, it is one consciousness, one love, one light that masquerades us all. Yeah. Gosh, so many new perspectives. This is just a beautiful interview. And um, you've given me so given me so much to think about. I'm sure you've given our listeners so much to think about. And I'm ready to take callers. I'm ready to take a caller. Um, Matt, we have so many callers on the line. You can't believe it. So I'm Go just going to... I'm just going to take a little chance and take this number that starts with a 501 area code. Let's see. Here we go. Hello, 501. Can you hear me? <laughs> Is it me? Yes. It's you. It's you. Yay. You um, made it. Thank you so much. I did. Um, thank you both for what you do, Matt. I absolutely love your work. Um the truth is, um, I was guided to call in. I don't have a specific question, but I followed my guidance, and um, here I am. I don't know if there's a message or something I need to hear. Of course. Try this out loud with me, because oftentimes I'll have people say things out loud to get things into their body. Okay. So try this out loud. In the name of learning to trust my highest guidance, In the name of learning to trust my highest guidance. I accept. I accept. That I am never wrong. That I am never wrong. And that other people who see life differently. And that other people who see life differently. Are totally right in their timeline from their perspective. In their timeline from their perspective. And that none of us need to agree on anything. And that none of us need to agree on anything. And I don't need anyone to validate my experience or what I know. And I don't need anyone to validate my experience or what I know. What I knew what I know is the highest authority of the divine. What I know is the highest authority of the divine. And it doesn't need to be understood. And it doesn't need to be understood. In order to be put into action. In order to be put into action. How does that feel when I have you say that? Wow. Um, you did hit on uh, an issue um, I do or have had in the past issues with self-acceptance and the need for validation. Um, less so, as I've worked on myself over the years. But there is there is still a sticking point with this where I... Um, you know, it's a particular situation from three years ago, and I've grown and learned, and you know, um, well, let's found even, let's, even, let's even let's even heal that right now. Try this out loud. Yes. No one is destined or designed to give me what I want. No one is destined or designed to give me what I want. I can engage with others. I can engage with others. I can be amused and endeared by their innocence. I can be amused and endeared by their innocence. But they're not necessarily here to give me what I want. But they're not necessarily here to give me what I want. Only I'm here to do that. Only I am here to do that. A partner is someone. A partner is someone. Who I share the fulfillment I've given to myself. Who I share the fulfillment I have given to myself. Who teaches me deeper ways to love myself. Who teaches me deeper ways to love myself. And as I love myself more in private. 
As I love myself more in private. I'll have more love to offer them in public. I'll have more love to offer them in public. That has nothing to do with the idea. That has nothing to do with the idea. That they're here. That they're here. To fulfill me in any way. To fulfill me in any way. Because that's my job as the love that I am. Because that's my job as the love I am. Wow. So that lets us know that a relationship occurs with two expressions of wholeness. When fragmentation meets fragmentation, no fulfillment will be found. Wow. So we have to find fulfillment in ourselves, be totally whole, Mm -hmm. and then we find the partner that can be our counterpart. And that every day we wake up in that relationship, and every day we choose that relationship as a brand new person. I'm not who I was yesterday. You're not who you were yesterday. I choose you again until I no longer choose you. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, So I'm in this space where, you know, you were talking about trusting the process. And, um, you know, and you were talking about everything is predestined. But I'm kind of in a space where it's open and I, I do have, um, I am in the space where I can choose what my next step is going to be. Good. Um, but I, I, uh, I don't like to use negative terms, but I lack the, the drive, or maybe I'm not grounded enough to actually put that next step into action. Um, what am I missing? No, nothing. Sorry? It's just not time. No, it's just not no. time. It's time to consider the choices. But okay. when the exact moment that you're meant to choose it, I try this out loud with me. I trust. Mm-hmm. I trust. That the lack of drive that I feel. That the lack of drive that I feel. Is not to be used as ammunition against myself. Is not to be used as ammunition against myself. But is showing me. But is showing me. That while this moment has been designed. That while this moment has been designed. To contemplate the options. To contemplate the options of my next move. Of my next move. It's also not the moment I meant to make a choice. It's also not the moment I meant to make a choice. Wow. And when I meant to make that choice. And when I meant to make that choice. I trust I will be the first to know. I trust I will be the first to know. To make the choice that's in my highest interest. To make the choice that's in my highest interests. To manifest my highest destiny. To manifest my highest destiny. That I accept has already occurred. That I accept has already occurred. So why don't I just enjoy the ride? So why don't I just enjoy the ride? How does that feel? That feels really good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So hopefully with the things that we did out loud, hopefully that that spoke deeply because I was just tuning into the subconscious mind and seeing what needed to be cleared out. Thank you. I really appreciate it, and God bless both of you. Well, thank you. Oh, it's my honor and pleasure so to much. serve you. Thank, thank you. you for calling in. Matt, that was incredible. Thank that was really thank good. Thank you. And thank well, you, Caller. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm sure, you know, this is the thing about that. You know, that might be... That caller might have had similar, uh, that might be very, that what was helpful to this caller might have helped a whole bunch of different callers and even sure. people that are listening out, um, even on uh, the repeat, you know, when they hear the show again at a different time. So that was beautiful and beautiful the way you tuned in. You want to take another caller, Matt? Absolutely, yes. Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, my goodness. This is a, this is a great show. Okay, so I'm going to take a caller. Uh, let's go with uh, 415. Let's try this. 218? 415. Hi. Yes, 218. 415. Wow. Aloha. Aloha. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. My name is Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Are you from Hawaii? 
I do. You did. Matt, I, you're wonderful. Yes. Yes, I love Kauai. Max, I've yeah. discovered you a little while ago. I've been watching all your videos. I wish I could have made it to the last week you just had. Um, I'm yeah. struggling. I have no voice, if you can hear. But my voice is not yeah. strong. I'm not able to express. I'm not able to get the words out. And it's complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on in my life, and I, you know, I wish I had an hour with you, and maybe I'll set that at another time. But <laughs> could you talk to me about the voice and let me know if there's anything that I need to know? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So Thank let's you. take let's take a complicated life and let's <laughs> make it simple. How's that? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so try the, try these words out loud. I, I love doing the repeat after me because it's it's one thing if I say something. If you have it, if you say it, it, it feels different. So try this out loud. The okay. key to awakening my most authentic voice. The key to awakening my most authentic voice is not in being so concerned with the choices I make. Is in not being so concerned about the choices I make. Or trying to choose the right words to say. Or trying to choose the right words to say. But in acknowledging and affirming. But in acknowledging and affirming. Only the di- only the light of divinity. Only the light of divinity. Speaks these words. Speaks these words. Only the light of divinity inhabits this body. Only the light of divinity inhabits this body. Only the light of divinity lives out what it's created. Only the light of divinity lives out what life is created. And in knowing this is so, and in knowing this is so, I hand over all of my power to the light within me. I hand over all of my power to the light within me. I bring forth the voice of my deepest truth. I bring forth the voice of my deepest truth. I relinquish all responsibility and attachment to outcome. I relinquish all my responsibility and attachment to the outcome. And allow the light of divinity within me. And allow the light of divinity within me. To speak all words. Speak all words. To make all choices. And make all choices. And to resolve all matters. And to resolve all matters. Here and now as I am. Here and now as I am. And what does it feel like having just said that? Just what do you feel in your body? A lightness and and a powerful and just like a surging energy. Do you want to know what else is different? My voice? Yes. <laughs> Just like that. That's magical. Thank you. You're welcome. The magic is is that we have to remember who's speaking these words. You remember who speaks these words. You declare the truth that speaks these words. You hand over the power of your words and choices to that truth within you. And all of a sudden, all the pressure is taken off your shoulders, and life can work through you to resolve what was only created to remind you how powerful you are. That is so helpful. My throat mm-hmm. feels less less stuck, too. <laughs> That's right. There's a lot of pressure on your throat, and it was all this pressure on your shoulders and throat of, i got to make the right decision. And I, and I personally, out of the love I have for you, don't require or need you to have that kind of pressure on your shoulders because once the pressure is removed, then you're going to make the best choices. So you give your power to the divine, just like you accept it's already occurred, and then from that point forward, you can start making the choices to make it so. Oh, so magical. Yay. Yay. Hey. <laughs> Yay. Can I ask one more quick question? I no, sure. not quick, but what yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going through a lot of life changes. Um okay. I actually packed up and moved myself. I did it to Kauai, I did it to Bali. I'm feeling like I need to do it again. There's this sense of not knowing where I wanna be. Right. I'll tell you right now where you should be. Right where I am? In, no, well, well, kind of. You okay. should be in your heart. Mm-hmm. 
anywhere you any Got location me. you go any location you go in your heart is going to work out for you. Any location that you go that you think is going to open your heart is going to be an illusion. So you have to open your heart first, not rely on an environment to open your heart. So open your heart first, be where you are, and then if you're called to be at a different location, enter the new location with an open heart and all will be fine. But if you're relying on the location to be what opens your heart, it's going to it's not going to be good. Oh, that makes sense. Yes, I always feel like I'm drawn to something. Something's calling me, like Kauai calls you, Bali calls well, you. Right. Well, in the, well, in because you're called to these different lands because they're vortexes, and you go to the vortexes, you receive the vibration of the vortex. It goes into your energy field, activates dormant things. It's kind of like, you know, we're all kind of like on this, you know treasure hunt and we're collecting different jewels that add to our you know vibrational frequency so i totally get the the things that you're drawn to in the earth and in the environment but what i would say is until life reveals exactly where you should go and don't try to push for the information let's Mm -hmm. just working on sitting where we're at loving our heart making sure i love you is the most popular thing you say to yourself and blessings of I, of I love you to everyone you pass by so that you are doing your best to open your heart to love so when you're told where to go, you're going aligned in love to manifest the highest potential in that environment. So beautiful. Cheers, man. Congratulations so on much. finding your voice. It's such a beautiful one. It is so wonderful to have it. Thank you. <laughs> Look at how good your voice sounds right now. Seriously, I know it's super clear. <laughs> okay, look at you. Look how magical like, you are. I was like, Wow. Yeah. Well, oh, congratulations. This is amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo. That was beautiful. Oh, Matt, that was so great. You know, when she hears the replay, you'll she'll be able to definitely hear the difference too. Oh, it's. Oh, it's a really oh, good point. I guess wherever you're called to, I mean, I guess we live in these bodies. I mean, sure. wherever we are, I guess. I mean, is there a special place for every single one of us, Matt? Well, yes, it's she in was our asking heart. about where to be, and, and is there really, is there, is there a special place where we really are meant to be? Yes, it's, it, that special place is in our hearts. And I say that literally, meaning... You could be in an environment where you think the energy of the community or the town around you is, you know, lost in third-dimensional fear programs. But if you're residing in an open heart where you are loving yourself and others, no matter how people are treating you, you'll begin to call forth the higher aspects of all people around you. Because we're all actually, here's what's funny, we're all in the same space of consciousness, but we're all living in our own timelines. We're all, we all think we're talking about the same world, but we're all living in our own world. So it's one thing to talk about the energy of different environments, and there is something to that, but we're actually living in our own world of perception. So if we love our own hearts, and loving our own hearts is what grounds our energy and expands our consciousness, it literally means that we can change our perception of the energy around us simply by making loving ourselves a higher priority. So it's easy to forget that we're all living in our own versions of the world. And it's easy to think that if I go to this location, it's going to feel better than in this location. And, of course, you know, there are, there, there are, you know, there is something to the fact of certain beings are attracted to certain ley lines and different you know, energetic phenomenon. Of course there's something to yeah. that. You know, you're called to yeah. go to a place, you go, you go through an activation, you go through a vortex, you know, you're there for five months and it kind of spits you out and you're on to the next place. But then there can be this energy where you always, th- you always need a new place to go because the ego needs contrast. It needs something new to get excited about. And it's at that point where we have to kind of look at the pattern and go, okay, I've gone to this place, I've gone to this sacred site, I've had my magical mystery tour. Maybe, mm-hmm. instead of always looking for a new place to be, as if it's the, just like, remember we talked about the soulmate, the outside person's not there to fulfill you. Hey, the 
outside vortex energy isn't there to fulfill you. Only settling into the love of your heart can ever fulfill you. So it has to be a balance between being open to the endless phenomena of miraculous existence and not being so in the clouds that we aren't grounded and rooted in being the source of our own loving fulfillment. At the same time, not being so overly logical that we push away the phenomenon that is literally beyond comprehension. So it really is a balance of both. And to be perfectly direct about it, the only thing that's going to help you find that perfect balance to be expanded as you are grounded is loving your heart. And so that's why I act as a bridge between the mystical realms and and the awakening journey. And I do that as a living transmission of love. And so love act in that respect love becomes the ultimate unifier uh, yeah yeah and that is nice and you're right i had to, uh, you know i think about my move to Kauai, which was big I had to come into my heart first and then i did connect with soul family and true friends here though too and this was an island that totally welcomed me supported me made helped me make a living provided me beautiful places to live. Even my dogs are happy here. So um, I think maybe, but it started with me first and not, not the outside first. I, I, was, I was ready and in the heart and ready for it first. I, I, I think I overlooked that. I just thought, you know, I, I, I saw it as I found my soul family and came into my heart. And really I came into my heart and then I found my soul family. Absolutely, and you know, any which or any which way, you know, any order that things evolve in is going to be perfect for our individual journey. There's no right or wrong way to do things. It's just one of those things where, if we're constantly going about things in a way and that we don't seem to get the results that we desire, maybe it's time to start looking at things differently. So, I really don't look at things as there's a right or a wrong way. It's almost like, you know, there are many approaches, and if you start taking the same approach over and over again, and you're finding the same results maybe we should take a deeper look at things. So, again, in in the name of love, it really is a very gentle turning around. You know, no one's wrong for, you know, if you're called to go to Scotland or go to, you know, Kauai or go here, I mean, you should, this is life. You're in a body. You should go wherever you want to be. At the same time, when we rely on locations, soulmate partnerships, children, when we rely on our career, our position in the universe, our contribution to humanity, when we rely on anything to be what fulfills us, we are unknowingly undermining our ability to allow the love within our hearts to be our only source of fulfillment. And the irony, of course, is once love is already the fulfillment within you, once you are the living, breathing embodiment of love and you are your own source of fulfillment it's at that point where you're put into the position to contribute to humanity it's at that point when your highest position in the universe is revealed it's that point where you find that soulmate relationship where you can actually become the parent you want to be it's at that point that you then find yourself living in a location and environment where that soul family can be revealed so again everyone has the right idea sometimes with the best of intentions we do things a little bit out of order yeah. Well, Matt, how are you feeling? You want to do one more caller? How how do you feel about one, that? Let's do one more. Oh, you want to do more? How do you? Let's how do one more are, are you up for? It? What? Oh, I'm always up for it. I'm always up for it. That's. Hi. Oh, geez. I, I love taking calls. I love serving all these beautiful souls. So I say we take you know one more caller and and uh, let's make this extra magical. Okay. I mean, even though I mean, I'm I'm open for this to go on too. It, you let me know where yeah. you're at, but uh, you have a slew of callers. So I'll tell you right now, you have a whole I would say bunch. Let's take, I, I would I would say let's take two more callers, and uh, that that's that's what I'm getting within me. And you okay. know, if I if I was if I wasn't on a schedule, <laughs> I would take yeah. every call. So I I am grateful that there's all these beings that want to connect, and I'm. Simply, I'm absolutely, you know, ready to to offer. But I would say, in the interest of my schedule, um, two would. But be how do you feel about this? Do you like six zero seven? You like eight one eight? You like seven eight five six six one nine four one? Let's Want me to pick it again? Eight one eight. Let's have it. Yeah. Eight one eight. Here it is. Eight one eight. Hello. 
Hello, is this me? Yes. Yes, you. Hi. Oh, oh my gosh. Hi. <laughs> this is Michelle. And I'm so thankful. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Matt, for everything. It's, wow, I'm overwhelmed almost talking to you because you're so instrumental right now in my journey. And, um, whew, I don't even know where to start, but (laughs) everything has resonated, all the callers so far. And I just was wondering, I mean, calling, before even calling in, what I was wondering is, it's like everything is um, in my life has been asking me to just slow down and stop. And so I've been listening to that and to the point where I'm not working, my car is gone, and I'm <laughs> kind of in a place of like, okay, allow everything to come to me. Right. And that's new. that's very new to me, and I'm just trying to navigate how – and when I would take any action as opposed to just allowing this time to really be <laughs> without making anything happen. Well, I, and, um, I, I would say, mm-hmm. well, I, yeah, I'm listening to what you're saying, and what I also feel like is that there, there is the allowing the, the, the action to come to you, but there, that could also be confused with refusing to take action, kind of like, I went from all this doing, and now I'm in the refusal to do, and then I'm just kind of sitting. What I would say Mm -hmm. is let's not refuse to do. Let's not misunderstand allowing as in I'm not going to take action. But let's just say of the options you have, what is the option that love guides you to make? And whatever choice love guides you to make, can you take that action step in the most slow down and loving conscious way? Does that make sense? Mm, it does. Um, yeah, I've been so sensitive to all of these energies and everything that's been happening that it literally has been challenging to do anything. <laughs> I agree. I understand. Up until this point, I finally feel a little more lightness that's coming through and more energy and so it's like I literally felt like I couldn't move if even I wanted to for a long time. Um, right. But I'm starting to feel different, which is amazing. And I'm yeah. going, okay, I feel like I want to emerge. I want to get out but, and do something. But, but I don't want to make it happen from my mind and just go into action for action's sake type of thing. Oh, well, to try this out loud. Let's, let's, let's unravel that judgment. Try this out loud. Whatever, okay. I, think comes, whatever I think comes from my mind. Whatever I think comes from my mind is always coming from the universe. <laughs> is always coming from the universe. So I don't need to make that distinction. I don't need to make that distinction. I just need to acknowledge. I just need to acknowledge that I have a desire to go back into the world. That I have a desire to go back into the world. Bringing forth this new energy. Bringing forth this new energy. And taking action from a more slowed down and conscious position. Mm, And taking action from a more slowed down and conscious position. And now that I've affirmed this. And now that I've affirmed this. I allow all opportunities to come my way. I allow all opportunities to come my way. And allow me to fulfill this in the most conscious way. And allow me to fulfill this in the most conscious way. And manifest a life of ease and abundance. And manifest a life of ease and abundance. That reminds me how incredibly miraculous I am. That reminds me how incredibly miraculous I am. How does that feel when you say that? (sighs) Really good. Very grounding and very relaxing. My my feeling is within the next two weeks at the soonest, month at the latest, you'll be going through your final integration and and these things will start coming to you and you'll be brought back into the world. Wow. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Well, that's good news, I hope. I think it's been quite a ride, I'd say. It is quite a ride. Again, you may not know what's going on and you may not know how to figure out what's occurring. But Mm -hmm. in the meantime, while you don't know, just cultivate more faith. I try this out loud. I don't need to know what's going on. I don't need to know what's going on. To have faith in a greater plan. 
to have faith and a greater plan. That I can't interrupt or do wrong. Hmm, that I can't interrupt or do wrong. Good. Oh, that's a relief. So don't get out, don't try to push your mind away. Thank it for helping you. Because, again, everything that arises we want to love. We don't want to push anything away. Because it's like, if you think about it, all is one, there is God, but then there's this mind that, that, is, that is problematic. How does that even work out? So it's, it doesn't make sense. So <laughs> treat right. your mind as God, and your mind will be revealed as the universe hiding inside your head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like that. And, and yeah. one last little part, the dizziness that I feel a lot, is that yeah. just part of this? It's part of it. It's part of when you're dizzy, you're going through upgrades. And when you're less dizzy, you're more integrated. So when you're dizzy, just have a seat wherever you're at. Yeah. You breathe slowly, meditate, um, you know, stretch, yoga stretches, you know, because the dizziness means you're being upgraded. And when you're being upgraded, you want to kind of just use the least amount of energy so all the energy can go to the upgrade. And when you're less dizzy or you're less fearful and more blissful, it's because it's integrated. Mm, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That's very helpful. And and do you think I would wait for this integrate everything that you're saying is coming soon to kind of feel better and then emerge, or just kind of see where things go and and if it feels I, right, then mm-hmm. I would just follow your feelings. Your feelings already know the divine plan, so I wouldn't say right. you have to figure it out. I would say just every day. If you have a day where you're feeling motivated to go out and look, you go out and look. Yeah. If not, yeah. if you feel dizzy, it's because, oh, I'm going through some energetic integrations and upgrades that are going to make yeah. my emergence afterwards that much more fulfilling. So I would just say you got to right. let your body lead the way. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Matt. My pleasure. It's an honor. <laughs> awesome. I'm in An- Angel Academy, so I'll hear you on Saturday, too. Yay. Fantastic. Yay. Well, uh, <laughs> honor to meet you, dear Angel. Uh, Thank you. You too. All righty. Oh, Matt, that was just yet another amazing uh, connection there. And uh, you could see how helpful that was to our caller. That was really, um, that was really very powerful. So, wow. Yes. Okay, you ready? Should we share one more? I have, you know, a couple yeah, of you these. Choose. Uh, you choose. Okay. Oh, that's so nice. I have, I have, um, I was looking, I mean, I have so many to pick from, but I'm looking at these, some of these are like from out of this country, like way far away. You could totally see from the Skype code. I'm going to take a little chance with this one. I, I'm going to try this. So let's see if I can, hello? Hello, caller? Can you hear me? They might not. That might not be the right choice for us, Matt. <laughs> Let's try another one. I'm like compelled to go with like something like foreign, like out of this country. Let's try this one. Hello. Hello. Caller. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Where are you calling are you from? from? Are you talking to me? Yes, yes. I am. Oh, fantastic. I'm calling from Perth, West Australia. Hello. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes. I sure can. Okay, okay beautiful. I'm, I'm, calling, I'm calling from West Australia. And um, hello, Matt. Hello. Hello. So what I'd like to talk about, um, I have two things. Um, one you have recently come into my partner in my own life, and we are living an immense life of abundance at the moment and awakening. Much has happened in the last five years, I would say, and you, you are a bit like the cherry on top. Wow. And, um, yeah, really exquisite. Well, firstly, I'd like to invite you to Perth because um, I have organized events here, and I feel such a pull for you to come. We had 10,000 people for someone last year, and... Um, I, I really, I didn't know that I was going to ask that one if you took my call, but it's just here right now. So um, there's an invitation. <laughs> I'll be in well, touch. Thank you. But what yeah, I actually touch. want to talk to you about personally um, is 
I'm noticing that in the kindness, uh, I feel a lot of love coming through me. There's a part where I notice there's an old conditioning of not telling the truth in order to not hurt another human being. Yes. Do you know what I mean? For example, someone wanted to book into a course I'm teaching in Whole Foods Cooking, and my gut was I didn't want this person here. She was um, she teaches, and I felt she was just coming to take my information. And I was aware of watching the reaction in me and loving that to death, but I still yeah. had to know, so I just told her the class was full. Right. And this is just an example, and it's just like it's just watching the pattern from childhood of not wanting to be straight, but now that I feel more awakened, it's more about wanting to be kind and not cause unnecessary pain. But in that, it, ha- it happened twice the other day, and I thought, okay, life is asking me to look at this. Right. To come into, and I don't know the balance between compassion and kindness when they're sort of what I consider not not major issues, like a cooking course, right. and when right. it's just like, why can't I be authentic, you know, to just say, I'm sorry, I, I get a no, I don't know why I get a no, but, you know, does that make sense? Right, well, it does, and so what I would say to you is this, when we are called into moments of honesty, or we find ourselves not being able to be very honest, and it's Again, I say it with compassion because we're very sensitive and we don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want anyone to feel excluded. All these types of things. Two things are happening. One, you forget in that moment you are forgetting that you are the universe dressed up as the person. And by not wanting to be totally honest with them, you are forgetting that they are the universe dressed up as the person as if you have to caretake for them or as if what you would say to them wouldn't just cause the universe as them to reorient their journey in a different trajectory that's already meant to be that way so literally when we come into these you know like sometimes people say the universe tests us and yes. i and i've been tested many times throughout my life but it's not a test like a make it or break it a pass fail it's not like reward and punishment so the universe tests us as a way to remind us how far we've come and to show us where we're at so we become aware of the curriculum of our growth and what we're learning And so part of the testing process the universe puts us through, again, not reward and punishment, just to show us where we're at and remind us what we're learning right now, is we're put in these moments of questionable honesty or ethics. And what we're measuring or seeing in that test is have I I been liberated from the attachment to my ego so deeply that I will actually tell the person the honest-to-God truth but I will say it with the loving tone that honors them as the universe. Mm. And that whatever their experience is in their own egoic experience brings up in you what then you can love. So what I would say is the greatest way to evolve is you have to be 100% honest. You have to, and and I'm going to teach you, and of course, not just teaching you, I'm teaching everyone on this call something remarkable Mm. about communication. This is something I learned early on Mm. because, again, I used to have the exact same problem you did. I used to Mm. make up imaginary reasons. That's probably the best word I could use. Imaginary reasons for Mm -hmm. softening the blow so that I could give someone the answer I wanted without hurting their feelings. When I was very young, I I used to make up, I used to make up a lot of phony stuff. And because I was afraid to be honest, I was afraid of being rejected. In my experience, I was afraid of being rejected, and I didn't want people to not like me. So what I learned about communication, and I've learned for me, you know, I've learned from the universe everything I know. What I've learned, and I thought this was fascinating when I learned this, I've learned that people don't respond to what I say. They respond to the tone and manner in which it's spoken. So if I say no in the most loving way, they walk away with the experience of the energy, not with what they think about my words. Mm. So if you every said time? every single time, I've and again, sometimes you're going to be in an experience where someone had an expectation and they're going to be disappointed. Because let's talk about disappointment really quick. Disappointment is when you tell someone something they did not expect, and by giving them something they didn't expect, you're giving back the power that they gave you. And so you can't, mm. you can't stop disappointing people 
your integrity is I'm just going to disappoint people in the most loving way so that as I give them back the power they don't know that they gave me, <clears throat> I'm going to speak to them with the love of honoring them as the universe. And I'm going to embody the universe that I am by staying true to my ethics and my truth. And so <clears throat> the person comes up and says, oh, I'd like to take your class. I'm so sorry, I get a no on that. And here's right. the thing. Not only do you say it in a direct and loving way, here's the next thing about communication. You do not give a reason. If they ask, uh, what's the reason, then you go, oh, well, I just tune in and I get a yes and no on things and I'm not getting a yes on that. You don't give a reason. You just say the answer in the most loving way. Oh, no, uh, I'm getting a no on that. And you just stand in the absolute fire of your nobility and you don't give a reason. Then if they ask for a reason, then you say, well, I just don't get a yes on that for whatever reason. Right, right. Because remember, people Very good. are not Because <laughs> here's the funny thing I've learned about this in my life. People were the most weirded out and resistant to me disappointing them when I was the most insecure about speaking my truth. When I became the most confident and loving, like I even had this, uh, I had an experience where I had a homeless person come up to me and my intuition just said, like, loud as can be, don't give them money for whatever reason. And they said, can I have a dollar? And I looked at them and I said, no, thank you. Like, I, I said it like they were offering me a cupcake. And they had this perplexed look on their face like... They said no, but they were acting like I was doing them a favor. Like I was, I responded like they were giving me a gift. Right, right. <laughs> and it was amazing yeah. because they didn't walk away mad and angry and disappointed. They walked away perplexed. Like they had the look on their face like, why am I not angry about this? Mm, mm, mm. I, I said to them, they said, can I have a dollar? And I said, no, thank you, but thanks for thinking of me. That's what I said to them. <laughs> Like, thanks for choosing me. Thanks for choosing me to possibly be your line of ascension, or your line of uh, abundance, rather. Thanks for thinking yeah, of yeah. me as your possible line of credit. My intuition says right. no, but thank you for reminding me how abundant I am. I mean, that takes an amount of courage and empowerment. Yeah. That is way beyond what most of us know in this world. So we have to really learn how to two things about this. You say the honest-to-God truth. Don't spin it. Just what's true in the most loving and soft tone. Just in your heart, say the answer. Do not give a reason. If they ask for a reason, then give a reason. But just answer the question they're asking and say it in the most loving way so that your integrity is, I told them what is true for me. But integrity says, I told them in a way and tone that is the most loving way I'd want someone to let me down. Mm, mm. And is it necessary do. to go back in retrospect and clean up a few little messes along the way or just from this moment on? Just this moment on. There's no reason to go backwards because whatever we didn't do at our highest ability will repeat. Right. Get another opportunity. Yeah, you, I guarantee you, you get another crack at it. I guarantee life <laughs> is good. Life knows what it's doing. Life's keeping track. Life goes, we're going to do that one again real soon. And it will reoccur, and it will probably be a similar situation until it becomes laughable. But you have to get used to just saying what is true. You can't think that, just like with children, you can't, you can't con protect children from change because you're not preparing them for the world. And by trying to not disappoint people, I'm not saying go disappoint people. I'm saying you can't help but disappoint people when you're not going to give them what, what they expect from you. And you can't try to not be yourself because you're not giving them a real-world experience, right? I mean, yeah. all is one, everything is love, but in the play of the world, the world is filled with dreams, expectations, possibilities, and disappointment. I mean, to be just totally real, that's life yeah. is filled with that. So we never know when it's next in line for us to be the one who gives people back their power by being the one that unknowingly disappoints the living crap out of them. And if mm -hmm, we can just mm -hmm. do it in the most loving way, and if we walk away horrified by what we said to them in honesty, then, then we can just love ourselves. But we, 
we let honesty be the foundation of our loving action. We say things to people in exactly the way we'd want to be told these words without compromising the integrity of saying what is true for us. Mm. Mm. And just to clarify, just before you said, and then if they ask for a reason, you give them a reason or you simply just say, I'm getting a yes, I'm getting a no. Is Wouldn't that it be sufficient amazing? A it, 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 is a, it is sufficient, but you actually have to decide how sufficient of a moment you're going to make it, meaning this person is a manifestation of the universe. You're going through your evolution. Like, so if we think of it like from how a soul thinks about it, a soul thinks of it like, oh, my God, if I was totally 100% honest, I would graduate past this chapter of my life and I'd skyrocket to a level of consciousness beyond my wildest imagination if I'm willing to do it. If I'm only going to do 50% honesty, then I'm only going to skyrocket 50% of the way. So the soul says... Mm -hmm. What if I just went off the rails bonkers, right? I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> right? I didn't get a yes on that. And they said, why? And you say, oh, because I feel that you're a teacher who is going to take all of my information, and I am making this decision based on that information, whether it's true or not. How revolutionary would that be? I sort of said that via email, and I got back incredible abuse, and I was malicious, and, and you know, all the things that I haven't identified with being, and I thought, oh, this is interesting, you know, to be right. viewed as a bad person for, for because I've managed to avoid that quite a lot. Um, well, so it, it was an amazing experience. It's, it's um, yeah, it's it left gives, me a little bit like, It gives you a like, chance. Ooh. Well, their maliciousness gives you a chance to wake up out of the identification of thinking that you're doing anything wrong. Your honesty yeah. is always going to bring people back to their experience. And if their ego is going to lash out at you, it's because they insist on you doing for them what they refuse to do for themselves. And when people don't get what they want, they either get really, really sad or they get really, really mean. And all yeah. you have to do, because yeah. here, here's why this happened. It happened because you're in a stage of your uh, evolution where you are no longer using other people's response and feedback to define where you are in consciousness. That's what you're waking up out of. So you manifest yeah. a horrendous response just to show you it's not about you. You cannot use other people's response to define. Like in, in codependency, we say if they take the news well and if they walk away smiling, I must have done it in alignment of love. But then we're defining our level of consciousness by their behavior. So this happened for life to show you only your conduct defines your level of consciousness and their response to you shows you where they're at. Mm, mm, yeah. I, and I have to add that I, I concluded the email with that I felt that she was a treasure in her teaching and that um, I was sure her book was a gift to everyone. And, and that was genuine and it sort of gave me just some relief in that moment. Right. You know, but I, I did um I did imbibe that from you, so thank you for that, you know, and um Right, and again yeah. remember this. When you are a hundred percent honest in every moment and you're just doing it in the most loving way, your soul is on a roller coaster. There's nothing more exhilarating than believing you're a person standing in front of another person and totally bearing your soul in the most outrageous mm -hmm. way. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's just, I'm going to tell you the honest-to-God truth and not sugarcoat <laughs> it and not water it down. Even like, you know, I don't even know if it's true what I'm thinking about you, but it's influenced my decision-making process. So based on the things that I don't know to be true but that I totally believe, I don't think you'll be coming to my class. Oh, my <laughs> God, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I just, I know you have to go. So I just want to add that my partner is very much like this, and he's trying to teach me how to get off the phone with people by just saying "gotta go" without a reason. Go. So we're like rehearsing sometimes. 
I gotta don't need go. to make up a story. You know, I just say, got to go. And it's, oh, it's so funny, this it, system. Yeah, this experience. Oh, my God, there's a, oh, my God, there's a tornado coming. Stop it. Just say, exactly. I, gotta, look, <laughs> like, look, oh, I love you. I love you. You've got so much that you want to say. I love you to death. You've got so much that you want to say. And I cannot listen anymore. So, please, let's, let's press pause here and let's pick up where we left off. But I have to leave right now. I love you so much. Now, here's the funny thing. An ego doesn't remember the first thing you say. It remembers the last thing you say or the thing you say most often. So if you say, I got to go, but I've loved talking with you. You're a treasure in my life and I adore you. In that statement, we said no once and we've said three different positive things and we've ended with a positive thing. They're going to walk away with a positive thing because the ego does not remember the first thing you say. It remembers either the last or the thing you said most often. Right. Fantastic. <laughs> Hilarious. So, last question. Coming back yeah. to my first question, last question. Do you have a yes to coming to West Australia? Because there's a lot of people say, here. <laughs> I would say that philosophically, I have been wanting to come to Australia for a long time, and that Julie and I and the people we are working with and our publishers, we are right now putting together a plan for a lot of things that's going to include a worldwide tour and we have a lot of things okay. being worked out that you know I, I couldn't make a decision right now because the decisions are made by uh you know the the, the people that are working behind the scenes um to 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 bring this out you know to the world but i would say that we you know it's it's on the list and when i come to australia i guarantee you Perth is a place I'm going to go because it's it's been on our list for a while, and we're just right now in the planning stages. And for a lot, you know, many who are listening to this, in a very short amount of time, we're going to be coming to a lot of different places, and so there's going to be an opportunity for us all to connect in person. Oh, beautiful. Super. Yeah, totally. That is a positive response. You didn't hear, uh, no, I don't resonate with that. <laughs> so you know. Oh, I do resonate. <laughs> I do write. Well, it sounded like an honest response to me. If, if, if yeah. someone is, you know, is that, that is pretty sounds good. true? Is that sounds true? Yeah. Who's organizing? Yeah, sounds true. Is my thank publisher. You. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you Matt. So much I'm, I look forward to uh, seeing you then. Thank you. My, yeah. It will be my pleasure. I look forward to it. Yeah, and thank you for your that response. Nice. Beautiful. And thank you thank for you. calling into the show. I'm glad. I'm glad I found okay. you out of all these calls. Yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Aww. You know, I'm going to tell you, Matt. That call helped so many people. It helped me. Yeah. I, I think I picked that. I think I picked that person just for myself. Uh, yeah, you know, she better. asked a question. Yeah, she asked a question that um, that was such a good answer for so many of us to hear. And when you do feel confident, when you do feel confident. It's easier to let people know, and people take it better when you don't tell them yes. I, but, um, I agree, and I also think I also here's two, two things I'll say really quick before we before we end. Right, we all know that we deserve love and we should love ourselves, but that doesn't mean that anyone knows the step by step process to love ourselves. And we all know we should be honest, but it doesn't mean we know the step by step process to be honest. So again, these are the kind of things I like to teach because we all know this. But it doesn't mean that we know step by step how to actually manifest and bring this to action. And so when we take something that we know to be true philosophically and we learn a step by step guide to bring it to life in the most loving way, transformation happens for the well being of all. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Matt, this has been such an amazing show. I have had, oh my God, I've had a great two hours and it flew by. Before we close, would you like to share with um, our listeners anything that you have coming up in the future? Well, let's see. Well, Any know, event? Um, well, this Saturday I'll be in Portland, Oregon, and we, of course, have two retreats a year. Right now we have our Angel Academy, which is a seven-week teleseries that we have going on, where even though the first week happened last Saturday, when you sign up for the Angel Academy, which you can sign up for the Angel Academy through our website at uh, truedivinenature.com, and when you sign up, you also get links for all the past weeks, so you can listen to each call as often as you want, and you get the download as well as you you know you would be able to hear the rest the rest of the six calls and perhaps even ask a question live on air. And um, you know from the Angel Academy seven week teleseries to the retreats we do twice a year, 
And uh, also, you can go to truedivinenature.com and sign up for our free newsletter. And we have lots of new announcements we're going to be making in the next week or so. We have energy updates that we put out and so many new things um, that really we always put out through our newsletter. And it lets us all who are living in various places around the world to come together and and unite as one and manifest a more loving world, one I love you at a time. So I would just invite everyone to sign up for our free newsletter, to join us at any of our upcoming events, be a part of the Angel Academy. And as always, it's an honor and a pleasure to serve the hearts of all and to remind every heart that it is nothing but love, to give it the opportunity to see how brightly it shines and to see how wide these angel wings can spread. Oh. Metcon, thank you so much for coming on to my show today. I love you, and our listeners love you, and everybody, you have left everyone that is tuned into this show feeling the love, and I thank you so very much, so very much for joining us today. My pleasure. So, without any further ado, I guess we better say goodbye, and I'd like to send to all of our listeners love, and light, and blessings to all. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Mahalo.